On Fridays, uh, the Culture Blaster, he uh, writes in, what's the new publication? The Voice of San Francisco. The Voice of San Francisco. He writes about movies, music. He really is the Culture Blaster, and he comes and goes on a rainbow. How about it for the great Michael Snyder? Happy Mother's Day weekend, everybody. Do your best to get out there and celebrate your mom. I am sending love to our favorite mother, Kim. Um, she's wow. here. Oh, um, thank every you. Weekday. Isn't that sweet? And yeah. Kim, how are you? I know yeah. what a dedicated Ch -ch -ch mother she is. I'm gonna, I'm mm. gonna send love to Mark's mother because yeah. I blame with, you. Without right. her, yeah. we don't get the magnificent Mark Thompson. Oh, thank to you. To your mama, to my mama, to everybody's mama. Happy Mother's Day to all. If you are in the uh, Bay Area, by the way, I have a Mother's Day gift suggestion: chocolate covered Hagen burgers. They are warm and gooey <laughs> and delicious. And if you're not in the Bay Area, because we do cover the West Coast. Uh, you could get the RFK Junior Mother's Day special, a chocolate-covered worm. Mm, delicious. I get it. I get it. By the yeah. way, before we before we get to the movie reviews, I've had a song running in my head all week. Um, I'm going to uh, essay a line. I know why Donald Trump's about to cry. Stormy Daniels. No. Oh. It's, it's an old classic. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I applaud that, Albert. That's disgusting. I'm sorry. Uh, right. It's the solar magnetic storm. I apologize. Yes, thank you. I'm glad that at least that there's a legitimate excuse. It's the best uh, I can come up are with. Are you going to review that Planet of the Apes movie that I'm hearing about? I'm they picking... say that it's going to be like the biggest weekend for of the year because of Planet of the Apes. The industry is holding its breath and hoping that uh, this will give a boost to the summer box office, even though it's May. Does this count as summer box office stuff? I think so. Um, so let's get down to it. I, I didn't go ape crazy for Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, which is the latest movie in the Planet of the Apes movie series. But as sure as I like a banana on my Cheerios, I gobbled it up. I thought it was a well-conceived, nicely performed, and beautifully rendered piece of big screen entertainment that works well as a continuation of the current iteration of the dystopian Homo sapiens versus smart simians science fiction franchise. Man, wow. that that's was a, a ton of ding words. That's a mouthful. Yeah. It is a, as big a mouthful as the title of the movie. Uh, for clarification, let me point out that it's the fourth installment in 20th century's ongoing resuscitation of a movie property that began back in 1968 with the blockbuster hit Planet of the Apes. Resuscitation is a ding word. Yeah. It adapted Pierre Boulle's 1963 novel of the same name and starred, we all remember, Charlton Heston and those <clears throat> damn dirty apes. The I, makeup guy for Planet of the Apes. Bud Westmore? With the, the one of the lead guys, he wasn't Bud, there were other makeup people on it. They had to make up every, you know, as you know, they had to make up the extras with the with the prosthetics. I mean, it was an sure. incredible makeup. Are you job. saying too much monkey business? He uh, was the father of our makeup guy at uh, in Los Angeles at my station in Los Angeles, and uh, he actually had pictures. He brought in a scrapbook. I asked him to see, do you have any pictures from the set? And back then, there were no digital pictures. Or and he brought in pictures of you know Roddy McDowell and all the rest of and them. Kim Hunter was yeah. Uh, Kim Hunter being made up in the uh, in the various prost prostheses. Really amazing. Well, um, uh, four more apes movies of varying quality were cranked out between seventy and seventy three to kind of capitalize on the popularity of the film uh, that uh, kicked it off. And it but it's took, enjoyed a renaissance now, it, right? It, well, yeah. It, it took a while though. There was a less successful one film revival, courtesy of Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes remake in two thousand one. Not a fan. And then this complete back to square one revival kicked off in 2011 with a, I would call it an invigorating, somewhat present day rise of the Planet of the Apes with James Franco as the lead human. And this is the setup. He genetically enhances the intellect of a young ape named Caesar, played by Andy Serkis, ah. Gollum himself, using motion capture, uh, while a virus that's deadly to humans ravages the planet. And that is what gets us into Dawn of the Planet of the Apes with Gary Oldman as the lead human, War for the Planet of the Apes with Woody Harrelson as the lead human. All of these recent efforts have been smartly written, very well acted, and enhanced by advances in special effects that replace the prosthetic ape makeup of the 60s and 70s with this hyper-realistic motion capture computer-generated uh, imagery. So Kingdom um, is set many decades after the uh, intellect of our hairy predecessors on the evolutionary scale was boosted. They are now the dominant species on Earth, and what's left of the human population has been reduced to savagery. And apes have built 
clans, most of them living in peace, but one would-be dictator who calls himself uh, Donaldus Trumpus Apus, no, uh, <laughs> Proximus Caesar, after the more benign progenitor ape of the other movies. Yes, yeah, Caesar was the... Uh... Yeah. yeah, the progenitor, the, very good. This guy progenitor. is trying to um, basically capitalize on Caesar's name, and um, he wants to basically be uh, the king. He, he, you know, it's crazy. He has these uh, simian shock troops who violently round up peaceful apes to become his enslaved subjects. So our hero is Noah of the Eagle Clan, whose members actually train uh, predator birds as pets and hunting companions. And when the Eagle Clan's village is raided, Noah survives and decides to hit the road to try and save his two best friends and his mom, happy Mother's Day, Noah, uh, who were uh, abducted by the Proxima Goon Squad. And along the way, he meets a wise orangutan and a human female, the likes of which he has never imagined. So leaning into the masterful motion capture tech, Owen Teague, is fantastic as Noah, expressive, noble, and brave. Peter Macon, who was the gruff but lovable alien Bordis on the Orville TV show, is wonderful as Raka, the orangutan, and Kevin Durand is fearsome as Proximus. Uh, we do have humans, Freya Allen, quite good as May, this enigmatic human woman. And hey, wait, 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 is that William H. Macy? Yes, it is. Wow. So, just to wrap up, the mocap and the computer-generated sets continue to attain new heights of sort of seamless believability, and West Ball's direction is action plus. If Josh Friedman's script sputters here and there as he tries to top previous uh, apathons and deliver a bunch of socially relevant subtexts uh, while setting up the next chapter in the saga, you know what? So be it. Not quite as tight and powerful as Rise, Dawn, and War, but this kingdom bodes well for more monkey shines. It is in theaters starting today. It is uh, something that shows promise then. Sounds like, Michael, you're right on board with what everybody's saying about Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. True that. Okay, so here's a weird thing. It's a sequel that's not really truly a sequel. There was a movie a few years ago called The Dry. The Dry was based on a global bestseller about an Australian federal agent who goes home to the small town that where he, where, this is where he was raised in the uh, arid hinterlands of Australia, thus the dry, uh, and he wants to uh, investigate a murder, and it basically throws the whole town asunder. Very good movie, The Dry, and it starred... Uh, Asunder's a dang word. Uh, Eric Bana as this guy... Yeah, he's brilliant. Uh, federal agent Aaron Falk. Well, Falk is back in Force of Nature, which is a follow-up, um, and for some reason, commercial considerations probably, it's subtitled The Dry <laughs> 2. I have no, it, it's in like wow, a that's lush, a weird, yeah. it's in like a lush, uh, you know, wooded region, but that's what they called it. Anyway, it's the investigative adventures of uh, Aaron Falk. And um, both of these movies, again, are best uh, based on best selling novels by Jane Harper. There's a third book in the series that could be adapted if this, uh, the, uh, if it goes as well as The Dry. Uh, this time out, Falk and his partner Carmen join the search for a missing woman named Alice who disappeared while on a wilderness retreat with four other female co-workers. Uh, the agents join the local cops to find Alice because she has access to valuable information that they seek to bring down the corrupt head of the company that employs her. So, you know, they have a rooting interest in digging this woman up. Um, Pardon so expression. to speak, right. Uh, the setting is a relatively lush, wooded, and mountainous area of Australia, as I said. Uh, it's about to be assaulted by a series of rainstorms, so calling this the Dry 2 as a subtitle, kind of a silly misnomer. There's a lot of flashing back and intercut narration. Not as taut as the Dry, but it still kept my interest regarding Alice's fate. Misnomer. And, and the outcome of the case that Falk and Carmen are working. The cast is on point and features a few familiar faces. Uh, specifically Anna Torv, who was on the uh, Fox TV show Fringe as Alice, uh, Jacqueline McKenzie, who was uh, on the 4400 and was in Malignant. She plays Carmen. And get this, Deborah Lee Furness, the veteran actress who happens to be the wife of Hugh Jackman for decades. They're still together, and she plays Alice's manager and the wife of the big boss at the company. Uh, Robert Connolly, who wrote and directed The Dry, returned to take on the same duties for Force of Nature, and the results are generally good. Even if it isn't quite up to The Dry, it is in select theaters. Wow. Seems like you generally liked it. Generally speaking. Yes. And now, here's the sad portion of today's show. Oh, no. Where talent is frittered away 
on a movie project that I had great hopes for. Pool Man is a Los Angeles neo-noir quasi-comedy. And I say quasi-comedy because laughs are in short supply here. It's directed, get ready, co-written, and starring Chris Pine. Yeah. Yeah. What could possibly go wrong? That Chris Pine, the immensely likable star of the recent Sword and Sorcery, Fun Star Fest. Trek guy, and yeah, the, Dungeons yeah. and Dragons, Captain Kirk in the big screen Star Trek reboot. In Pool Man, he plays the title character Darren Barronman, mm -hmm. a well-meaning conspiracy-oriented, no, we'll say conspiracy-obsessed pool man at one of those slightly seedy L.A. motel-style apartment complexes. So Darren wants the best for his hometown, and to that end, he haunts city council meetings and rambles on and on about various civic improvement ideas he has uh, to the chagrin of most council members. The character seems kind of self-absorbed to the point of being wasted, and in fact, there are hallucinogenic sequences that are not drug-inspired, but uh, simply the product of Darren's generally spaced out demeanor. It is feeling Lebowski-ish, though. Is he a Lebowski-type character? There is a Lebowski element. Good call, Mark. You didn't even see the movie, and you jumped on that. <laughs> right. Bravo. Uh, anyway, um, I, it's... I'll just say that even though he uncovers a plot to leech off L.A.'s precious water reserves during a drought, he seems pretty wasted most of the time. And here's the sad part. Speaking of wasted, Pine has gathered a bunch of excellent well-regarded performers to support him, but they're let down by uh, a circuitous dialogue-stuffed script that never hits the spot. They wow. are all Yeah, well, you know, that's just like your opinion, man. <laughs> no, no, I think this is almost fact. Okay. Right. Um, uh, Pine is game, so is everybody else. This is clearly a passion project for him. With Annette Benning and Danny DeVito wow. as Darren's neighbors. Well, that has to be funny or... And he plays their, the neighbors and parental figures, and they are they give their all. Are you ready for an esteemed actress? Jennifer Jason Lee plays his disgruntled girlfriend. Wow. And there are character actors supreme in this. Clancy Brown, Stephen Tobolowski, uh, Ray Wise. You may remember him from Twin Peaks. They're all on board. Uh, the, the cast is an embarrassment of riches, and I could make an embarrassment as a key word joke but that would be unduly harsh. I didn't hate it, but uh, I, I tolerated it thanks to the wow. enthusiasm everybody brought to the project, as well as my love of Los Angeles-based uh, film noir. And, sure, yeah, and it is film noir. Yeah, well, they try to do that. There are blatant references to the setting and retro Raymond Chandlerisms of uh, the superb and classic Roman Polanski motion picture Chinatown. Sure. And that only diminishes Pool Man by comparison. It is in I theater. See, oh. You know, has it ever occurred to you yeah. that <laughs> instead of uh, you know, running around uh, uh, blaming me, you know, given the nature of all this news, you know, it, 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 this could be a, a, a lot more uh, 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 complex. I mean, it's not just, it might not be just such a simple, uh, you know? That's probably, that sort of delivery is about two-thirds of the movie. Um, but let, come on, let's what wrap else up. do you have? Let's wrap uh, up the movie segment. All right, please. Uh, and speaking of passion projects, a more successful one, even if it's sort of a boilerplate period biopic, is Jean Dubarry, which is directed, co-written, and starring French actress uh, Maywin. Maywin? Maywin. Uh, she plays the title role of Louis XV's favorite courtesan, and this features none other than part-time French resident Johnny Depp as Louis. Wow. So uh, make no mistake, though, Mark, despite her globally recognized co-star, this is uh, Mai Wen's movie. For most of Depp's scenes, he just lays around like a king does in the lap of luxury. Not a, not a taxing role. Let's just say that when his Louis isn't bedecked in finery and slowly strolling past lines of adoring courtiers and supplicants, he's generally... I don't know, stretched out on plush couches, eating fruit, drinking wine, or humping Jean on the royal bed when he isn't uh, screwing another mistress. Right. I, it's nice work if you can get it. Well, I mean, is he, how much of a part of the movie is he? He is significant because their relationship is what sustains her in I court. See. Uh, but, you know, it's clearly uh, Mai Wen's film. Uh, Madame Dubarry and Mai Wen are the focus. And she acquits herself in stylish fashion, especially in the performances of Dubarry, uh, the poor bastard girl from a convent who leaves that poverty behind to live the high life 
uh, at the palace when she enchants and reinvigorates Louis the Fifteenth. Of course, the aristocrats, especially a couple of Louis's daughters, hate her and plot against her. But Jean, adored by the king, is undaunted. Even if the overall impact of Jean du Barry is rather muted, it's a decent diversion for those people who are interested in pre-revolution uh, power plays and shenanigans at Versailles. Uh, it is in theaters. Wow. It's, uh, I thought you were going to really take a sort of ugly Michael Snyder blowtorch to it, but you didn't in the end. I, I would have liked to, but I couldn't. I couldn't bring myself to do it, Mark. I just, you know, I kind of, I'm a Francophile. What can I tell you? You are that. You're a French-speaking fool. What else do you have for us? I'll give you one more. Okay, how about um, a quick thing on uh, some TV show, well, at least one TV show I'm really excited about, and I had an inquiry from a couple listeners about it. Three okay. Body Problem. Three uh, Body Problem. Is on Netflix. It's an American science fiction TV series created by, and here's your pedigree, David Benioff and D.B. Weiss, who wow. are the guys behind Game of Thrones. Uh, and Alexander Wu, and it's based on a Hugo Award-winning Chinese novel called The Three-Body Problem. It's the second live-action adaptation after the 2023 Chinese television series, and they spared no expense here. The series premiered on Netflix with eight episodes on um, March 21st, and I finally got around to watching the whole thing. Um, it, it's about a, a, an astrophysicist who sees her father beaten to death during... Um, a, a struggle in the Chinese Cultural Revolution, and she is conscripted by the military. And due to her scientific background, she's sent to a secret military base in a very remote region. Um, and her decision at the base is to react to contact from an alien planet. Uh, and uh, all of that implicates a group of scientists in the present day. So it swings from the past in uh, revolutionary China to the modern day as we're having first contact or what appears to be first contact. So uh, it could be a threat. It could be a boon. This thing has a Jovan Adepto, uh, Adepo from The Leftovers and Jack Ryan, uh, John Bradley uh, from Game of Thrones, Rosalind Chow from Deep Space Nine, um, and, uh, you know, Benedict Wong, Jonathan Price, great cast, wow. and complex and wow. engaging and engrossing three-body problem on Netflix. If you're a sci-fi fan, it's the smart sci-fi. How many episodes, sir? Uh, there are, if I'm not mistaken, a total of eight episodes and worth your time. Great. I may check that out. Three Body Problem is what it's called. Sci-fi from the guys behind Game of Thrones. Find it on Netflix. Jean Dubarry with Mei Wen as Madame Dubarry and Johnny Depp. Um, he likes it. Uh, I would say that Michael liked it. If I had to get, uh, uh, apply a letter grade to it, I'd give it a B minus maybe is what I'm thinking yeah, from you. B minus, C plus. It, it, it's, it, is what it's, it does what it wants to do. All right. Uh, Pool Man is the Chris Pine movie. He wrote it. He stars in it. He's got it chock full of other stars based on what you're saying. Doesn't this sound a little bit like unfrosted Jerry Seinfeld? Uh, it's funny, as, you, as you were telling us about it, I thought, oh, this is Chris Pine's unfrosted. That's what this wow. is. But uh, it is, uh, you didn't like unfrosted, I'll remind everybody, but so uh, to put it in context, Pool Man is not all the way over. You really didn't think there was much redeeming about unfrosted, but this, you thought, just misses. It's not... Uh, super bad like no waste of time no, what no, i got no. from you it's just kind of meh it's sort of it's it, the, it, it, the, it, te it, the tedium problem and you can't do something like this um and not beg for comparisons with the big lebowski as you pointed out and chinatown and, right so yeah it's now just... I, I i'm intrigued though i love the idea by the way of well, you know, we have we used to do a thing on the radio called City Council Theater, where people come on, they make their speeches in front of the city council. It's just absolute craziness. It still happens. And I love the idea that Chris Pine has integrated that into his character. Right, his harangues are great. And Stephen Tobolowsky, who plays, he's, he's a great character too. We should get him on the show. From yeah. um, Groundhog Day and many, 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 many films. He was on he, my old podcast. He yeah. is up front. Uh, the, uh, the long-suffering head of the council has to deal with Chris Pine's character. Okay, that's terrific. So that's Pool Man. Again, kind of misses for Michael, but uh, it is out there in theaters. The Eric Bana film, which is a sequel, Force of Nature, The Dry 2. It's the mystery thriller. It's um, 
Robert Connolly, who wrote and directed it, and again, it's the sequel to The Dry, and uh, Eric Bana and uh, Deborah Lee Furness has a uh, small part, I think. A, it's a fairly significant role. Plays the wife of uh, the, the boss of uh, the company. It's right. investigative adventures of Aaron Falk and looking for a missing woman. Everyone wants to find her for different reasons is what I got. Right, right. It's not, it should be clear, it's not really a sequel to The Dry. It's the continuated, uh, continuation of the adventures of uh, I see. Aaron Falk. Okay. Uh, and you liked it. I kind of got the I impression did. you liked it. Yes. I okay. I, I liked it a skosh better than Jean Dubarry, but I kind of revel in that kind of period. You like that French history, stuff. Yeah. You, know. you like to, you know, you like the Francaise, huh? <laughs> Same place. Uh, and he started with the much anticipated, certainly anticipated by Hollywood, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. Michael says not as good as some of the other iterations of the uh, various apes movies, but not bad. Oh, it's considerably better than the sequels to the first movie back in the 60s. Well, and 70s. better than those, but, but, but I'm talking these, about in the, the mod, in the modern age. In this quartet of films, it's maybe the least of them, uh, but that says a lot of positive things about what they've done by reinventing the property, and they've done a good job, and this is a good movie. Well, that's a very high-end review with a with suggesting sort of these latest iterations, the quartet of films. I hear you, Michael. I hear your verbiage and how you frame everything now with a new appreciation for the way they are looking at this project and reimagining it. I hear you, Michael. I hear you. I don't think a lot of people hear you. I hear you. That's a beautiful thing. And I want to say before we sign off, my current column in The Voice of San Francisco, which you can read at thevoicesf.org is all about franchise fatigue and it brings up Deadpool and Wolverine. It brings wow. up um, the, this Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes and um, the later uh, installments of franchises that have faltered because they went to the well once too often. To, that is, I'm going to read, is that available now? Absolutely. And it's Voice of San Francisco? What is it? It's at thevoicesf.org. The Voice sf.org right uh, franchise fatigue i think that's a terrific subject i'm so glad you took it on uh you can find michael snyder there at the voice sf.org we have it there on the screen for you and you can find him here every friday he is the culture blaster and thank you for your reflections on my dear friend sam he comes and goes on a rainbow Bye-bye, Michael. I'm going to say it. Go Giants. It's going to be an uphill battle. Oh, yeah. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell. You'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.